Father in heaven, thank you so much for the wonderful message in that song this morning. Thank you so much that when we do scrape our knees and when we get knocked flat on our face, and thank you when we run into hard hearts, thank you that we can run home and we can get on our knees and we can cry and you will hear and you will answer and you will pick us up and you will set us on our way. Thank you that when we're going through a parched desert, thank you that you'll provide that drink of water. And thank you so much that when we feel all alone that You've promised that you're with us always, even to the ends of the world. We praise you today that you know how many hairs are on our head and you care about us. Please guide us this morning through the Holy Spirit, unseen as the wind, but please move in our midst today and help us to know that we have been here and been with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's open our Bibles this morning. Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. You know, Hosea chapter 4 is not a very pleasing or hopeful chapter. The pictures in Hosea chapter 4 are very unappealing. As we have found in our series and our study of the Minor Prophets, we found that what is written in the Minor Prophets, in the Old Testament for that matter, uh, was written especially for a group of people living at the end of verse history. And so Hosea is just another one of those Old Testament books whose greatest application is for those upon whom the ends of the world are come. And as I said, the picture in Hosea chapter 4 is not very appealing. But as I looked in Hosea chapter 4 this week, I realized there is a way out. There is a place of escape. And we will look at that as well this morning. Let's start with verses uh, 1 through 5. Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Therefore shall the land mourn, and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish. With the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, yea, the fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Yet let no man strive nor reprove another, for thy people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Now who does this apply to? Could you say it just a little bit louder? Charlie? Charlie? Us. Us. Verse 1 says, Ye children of Israel, that's what we are, modern Israel. That's right, Gary. We are modern Israel. We are modern Israel. Verse 1 says, The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. You say, but wait a minute, Bill. This is talking about the land. It's talking about people outside of the... No, it's not, folks. You say, but wait a minute. It says there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Bill, we have the truth. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We've got the truth. 
So how can you say there's no truth? There's no knowledge of God in the land. Every Sabbath we come in and we talk about God. And in Seventh-day Adventist churches we talk about God. So isn't there a knowledge of God in the land? According to Hosea chapter 4, there isn't. By swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. Is that talking about people in the world? talking about Israel, God's professed people, swearing? Now, I used to swear. Have you ever used bad language? Have you ever swore? I have. I used to. Not proud of it. Before I was a Christian, before I knew anything about a living and loving God, Oh, I used to say filthy things. Not proud of it. But this isn't talking about people that have no knowledge, that have not had access to the Bible and to books, is it? It's not talking about them. Can we swear without taking God's name in vain? Can we? We can. How can we do that? You say the only way that we can break the third commandment by swearing and, and taking God's name in vain, the only way we can do that is by using God's name in an inappropriate manner. No, that's not it. It's by professing one thing and doing something else. It's by claiming to be following God and then by our actions, we're not. We're swearing. We're taking God's name in vain, aren't we? We're claiming to be one of His followers, but we're not representing Him. Yep. Yeah, do what I say, but don't do what I do. That's right, Diane. And lying... Killing. You say, Bill, this is going way too far. I don't kill people. Do we kill people when we hurt or try to destroy somebody else's reputation? Do we kill them? Sure we do. Sure we do. And I use the word we because we are all guilty of that. And we steal. We commit adultery. Blood toucheth blood. These are Seventh-day Adventists. Is there any hope for people like that? Is there? <laughs> Doesn't look very pretty there, does it? Hosea 4 and verse 6. Notice what it says. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I can't think of a people on the face of the earth today that has more knowledge than Seventh-day Adventists. And the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. There's some kind of knowledge that we're missing. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten 
the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. We have forgotten the law of God? That's what Hosea said. Prophet, Prophets and Kings, page 297. It says, In every age, transgression of God's law has been followed by the same result. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. In the days of Noah, when every principle of right doing was violated and iniquity became so deep and widespread that God could no longer bear with it, the decree went forth, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Genesis 6 and verse 7. So when people set aside the law of God, what is the sure result? Destruction. Destruction. There's going to be stealing. There's going to be lying. There's going to be committing adultery. There's going to be swearing and taking the name of God in vain. All of those things. And what will be the ultimate result of rejecting the law of God? What will happen? What will happen? Okay, individually, we'll miss heaven. Corporately, there'll be punishment. There will be destruction. Now, within Seventh-day Adventism today, we have the same mindset that was in Judaism in the first century, and that was, I'm one of God's people. And it doesn't matter what I do, because I'm one of God's people. And God loves me and He's going to save me regardless of what I do. doesn't work that way, folks. There is a consequence for transgression. There's a consequence. The result, the sure result will always follow. The time preceding the captivity of the ten tribes of Israel was one of similar disobedience and of similar wickedness. God's law was counted as a thing of naught, and this opened the floodgates of iniquity upon Israel. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. So it applied back in history to the time of the flood. It applied to the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. It applied to the time of the ten tribes. It applied to the children of Israel in the first century. And Great Controversy, page 60, says that the condition of the world under the Romish power presented a fearful and striking fulfillment of the words of the prophet Hosea. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. So it applied in the dark ages as well. And it still applies today. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I'm going to do something this morning that I very, very rarely do. I'm going to read something from a book. It's not Spirit of Prophecy, even though when I heard it first read to me, I thought it was. It's a book called The Disciplined Life by Richard Taylor. It's not an Adventist. The book was published by um, Bethany Fellowship in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bethany House Publishers. And I can hear maybe somebody out there saying, this better be good. He's not an Adventist. Folk, there was something missing in Israel and there's something missing amongst God's people today. 
I think Richard Taylor has an answer for us that I thought was absolutely powerful. It says this, page 26 and on. It says, self-discipline is the ability to regulate conduct by principle and judgment rather than by impulse, desire, high pressure, or social custom. It is basically the ability to subordinate. What's that mean? It simply means this. We can have all knowledge. We can have the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and all kinds of books and we can understand all kinds of things. But you know what? It doesn't amount to a hill of beans unless we submit. You know that? When you think of the, the story of the ten virgins of Matthew chapter 25... What was the one difference between the two? Did they all have lamps? Yeah. They all had lamps. And what did the lamp represent? What did it represent? It represents the lamp of truth, or as David in the psalm says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Did all the virgins have the Bible? They all did, didn't they? What was the difference? There was a difference, wasn't there? Five had discipline, five had no discipline. Okay, five had discipline, five had no discipline. But what did five have in their lamp? They had oil, and the other five didn't. And what did the oil represent? Represented the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, verse 6. That's what the oil represented, was the Holy Spirit. So the five wise submitted they surrendered. They gave up. They subordinated their will to the will of God. And the other five, who knew just as much as the five wise, the five foolish knew everything, didn't they? Because they had the lamp. But the five foolish never subordinated their will to God. And as a result, when the bridegroom came, the five wise went in to the marriage, and the five foolish came in after and said, please open to us. And what did the bridegroom say? He said, I never knew you. You say, but wait a minute, Jesus knows everybody. Doesn't he? Connie read the verse in Sabbath school in Matthew 10. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Does Jesus know us? Does he or doesn't he? Jesus knows each one of us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So how could he say, I never knew you? Isn't that a dichotomy? How can that be? He knows our name. He knows how many hairs are on our head. We're fearfully and wonder, wonderfully made. He made every part of our body. And he tells the five foolish, I never knew you. If we hide ourselves, how can you know us? Let's hold on to that concept of knowing. We'll get to that after a while. Okay, okay, let me go on with uh, Mr. Taylor. Talking about subordinating or submitting our impulses, our desires, our high pressure, our, our customs. There are several aspects here, he says. For one thing, there is included the ability to subordinate the body and its physical appetites to the service of the mind. Paul said, I keep my body under. Now let's think about that passage for a moment in this concept of subordination or submitting or becoming a disciple. 
1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Let's notice these passages as far as discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul talks about the Greek and the Romans, the Europeans of his day, about the young men who would train for years, who would run up and down the hills of Greece and Asia Minor, who would discipline their lives, submitting and keeping in subjection their desires and impulses. Why did they do it? To win a wreath. Now is that ludicrous or what? I think of the trophies on an entertainment center that we have in our living room at home. There's probably 15 trophies up there for basketball and baseball. And I think back to the hours and hours and hours and hours that were spent in training, in sweating, in weightlifting, I did all that for those. And Paul says, they do it for a corruptible crown. I did it for something that's corruptible. If you look at those trophies today, you can go like that and you can wipe it off and you got about, oh, say an eighth of an inch of dust. I sweated for that. And Paul says, they do it for a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We're going after a goal that will never perish. We're going after a crown that will never dim in luster, that will never have dust. Is it worth it to us to think about disciplining our impulses, our desires? Is it worth thinking about this morning? Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul was concerned about swearing, wasn't he? He said, I can get up and preach, but I better keep my body under and bring it into subjection or I'm going to take God's name in vain and misrepresent Him. And I'll be a castaway. You know, I was talking the other day with a gentleman, doesn't matter who it was, it's nobody in here, by the way. But we were visiting and uh, he was talking about some trials that he was going through and, and I don't know the man very well and so I just, uh, we got to talking about exercise and, and uh, he said, he said, do you get any exercise? And I said, well, you know, I really need to 
because um, I do a lot of sitting, I do a lot of reading, I do a lot of writing, uh, I visit people and I'm sitting. And so I said, I need to get out and exercise. And so I go out to the, the, to the gym and I run five days a week and I lift weights three days a week. And uh, he said, boy, I, I'll, bet, I'll bet that's tough. And I said, well, you know what? You know where the toughest place is? It's not in my feet or my ankles or my legs or my heart. It's all up here. That's where the battle is, is right here in my mind. Because I said, I don't know how many times I have stepped onto the treadmill at the YMCA and thought, Bill, what in the world are you doing here? Why don't you go home where it's nice and cool instead of sweating up a storm? What are you doing here? But I get on the treadmill anyway, and I run anyway, even though this little brain up here says, don't do that. Go home and turn on the TV and pull out a bag of chips and just have a field day. And the man said, you know what, I know exactly what you're talking about. He said, I've got a treadmill at home. I've got a weight system at home. It's upstairs. But he said, you know what? I just, it's, it's a whole lot easier just to sit down at night and just put the remote control on and sit in front of the television set. That's just a whole lot easier for me. I was very happy to notice in the course of our conversation that he was making a resolve in his mind. He said, you know, I've got to do that. And I told him, I said, you're going to feel so much better. You're going to feel good if you do that. And I said, you know, the strain and the stress that you're going through, it's going to help the mind deal with the stress in your life. Now maybe somebody in here is saying, Bill, you know, I've passed three score and ten now, and I really can't exercise the way I like to or the way I used to, and my body just doesn't want to do it. That's not a good excuse. There is always some kind. There is always some kind of exercise that we can do. Always. Even if it means getting a little dumbbell and going like this or going like this. We can do that. So we feel good. This was exemplified by a fellow preacher who became convinced that coffee was affecting his heart. A Norwegian who had enjoyed his coffee all his life. But he said that moment it became a matter of conscience with me, so I stopped. Just that simple. He hasn't touched it since. This ability was also seen in another friend who was overweight. When challenged by the doctor, he resolutely embarked on a rugged diet which he maintained in all company at all places and times until his weight was normal, much to the improvement of his health. He explained simply, it's not a question of willpower, it's a question of won't power. No thank you, I won't have any. Such drastic adjustments are not always necessary, but the day-by-day -day discipline in many little things is. In truth, we may say that the finest dis display of such discipline is not the spectacular achievement, but the permanent adjustment of living pattern. You say, that sounds fanatical, Bill. <laughs> you know what? If Daniel wasn't a fanatic, the book of Daniel would have never been written. Do you realize that? Do you realize what the world owes to the man who walked in Babylonian courts. Do you realize what we owe that man? 
God was able to use him because his mind was clear. Daniel was a fanatic, and it's time we do become fanatics too. It's okay today to be a fanatic of the folk from T.D. Waterhouse, isn't it? The Orlando Magic. It's okay to be a fan of the Orlando Magic. Or it's okay to be a fan of the New York Yankees. Or it's okay to be a fan of some other sports play player. How about if we became fans of the diet plans of the prophet Daniel. Let's go to another area here. The subordination of the physical includes not only the appetite for food, but also the sex urge. In some, this has been so humored that it is abnormally excitable. To make matters worse, worse, such persons often live by the creed of impotence. I can't help it. And similar expressions of moral flabbiness. Overindulgence, even within marriage, may have the effect of cultivating this basic urge until it is increasingly imperious in its demands. Those so afflicted are in grave danger of succumbing to temptations from outside marriage when domestic stress, frigidity in their mates, long illness, or separation subject their enfeebled powers of self-control to an abnormal strain. I don't know if you've noticed in our world today but there is an excuse for everything. Have you noticed that? I noticed, bless my real mom's heart. She's not the one from the northwest or the southwest or the northeast. My real mom. Bless her heart. When I was out there visiting this few weeks ago, and she sat down with me, and I love her to pieces, all five foot, one and a half, 93 pounds of her. And she said, now, Bill, she said, you know, you're older. Your sister has had cancer about three times. And one of your older brothers has very high cholesterol. And he's taking cholesterol medication." And your younger brother also is taking medicine for cholesterol. And she said, I want to make sure that you're getting a good health checkup to make sure that you don't have high cholesterol too. Because she said, you know that having high cholesterol is hereditary. And I said, Mom... I said, I don't know who wrote that cholesterol, high cholesterol is hereditary. But I said, Mom, that's not true. I said, cholesterol runs in families who eat certain things. I said, it's not hereditary, Mom. I said, the reason that my next older brother and my younger brother both have high cholesterol and I don't is simply because of what I put into my mouth that's different from them. And I said, Mom, if you've ever looked on a label, if you've ever gotten apples or grapes or other fruits and vegetables, I said, you won't find any cholesterol in those. But I said, Mom, if you get out the meat and you get out the cheese and the other dairy products, they all have cholesterol in them. And I said, Mom, I said, if my older brother and my younger brother and you, if you would eliminate meats and meat byproducts for one month, I said, your cholesterol level was stabilized. So we have an excuse. Oh, it's hereditary. 
My grandpa was like that and my dad was like that. Therefore, I have no choice. I'm had. You believe that? That's predestination. I'm predetermined to be a certain way just because my grandfather and my dad were that way. Is that the way it is? Uh-uh. Will I subordinate myself to the will of God or will I not? That's the issue. At this point in the sermon, I want to say one thing. When I see people's eyes close, you know what I feel like doing? I feel like going over and sitting down next to them, patting them on the shoulder and saying, isn't that a great sermon? Okay. Too often, the moral downfall of men is blamed on some failure in their wives. Did you hear that? How many of you heard that? Okay. That is a cowardly evasion of moral responsibility. The man of disciplined character does not have to have a warm, responsive wife who caters to his every impulse to keep him in the path of virtue. He keeps himself there by the grace of God. If his relationship with his wife is happy, he's grateful. If it is not, he simply appropriates more grace and demonstrates the man that he is. Now, what do we hear today? Probably the, the most heinous and awful thing that we hear today coming out of married people's lives who have been unfaithful. You know what they say? They say, I fell in love with somebody else. Haven't you heard that? I fell in love with some. That's love? No. That's animal lust. That's what it is. Now, what did Mr. Taylor say in here? If a wife, for whatever reason, is not fulfilling exactly what the husband would like, is that then the license? Is that then the excuse for the man to say, hasta la vista, I'm going somewhere else? Is that an excuse? What is that? That is total animal lust. That's what it is. Total selfishness, Augie. Total and complete selfishness. The whole issue comes down to will a person subordinate and submit themselves? Will they or will they not? That's the issue. A weak man is a poor wrist no matter how warm is his wife. A strong man will keep himself pure even if it means total abstinence the rest of his life. This guy's a revolutionary, isn't he? In modern terms today, this guy is a revolutionary. That's right, Samuel. <laughs> he is. I believe this man is a born-again Christian. Richard Taylor. A strong man will keep himself pure even if it means total abstinence the rest of his life. And it must emphatically be affirmed that this is not just a matter of being made that way or natural temperament. It's a matter of achieving complete subordination. Do you know the word discipline? What is the first part of the word discipline? It's disciple. And so somebody who is a disciple of Christ, 
they have submitted their will, their impulses, their desires to Him. You know, I, I lose track of time anymore. I'll just say a little while ago, I was asked to perform this wedding. I didn't know the people, but I knew the a relative. And I said, if that would help you, I'll do it. Well, when I got there to the place of the wedding, the woman informed me, she said, when you announce us after the ceremony, she said, I want you to announce me as, and then she gave her full maiden name, and she said, I want you to announce me with my full maiden name and then tack on my husband's name at the end. And I scratched my head and I, and I looked at her and I said, now, are you sure that's how you want me to say it? And she said, absolutely. And I said, does your husband know that? She said, well, if he doesn't know it now, he'll know it then. And I took off my glasses and I thought, yeah, I guess he will. So anyway, I went downstairs and I met her husband for the first time, her husband-to-be, and I said, um, I went through the, the ceremony and I said, now at the end of it, your wife-to-be has said she wants her full maiden name with your name at the end. Is that all right with you? He said, yeah, go ahead. That's, that's no problem. Well, about five days after the wedding, I had a phone call from him. And he said, um, he said, I haven't seen my wife for five days. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, I haven't seen her for five days. I said, how long have you been married? I thought it was five days ago. He said, it was. And I said, you're not living in the same home. He said, no, I'm living in a certain part of Florida and she's living in another part of Florida. Oh, sounds like a good relationship. He said, what do I do? He said, we haven't consummated the marriage. We, we have not, I haven't even seen her since 10 o'clock the wedding night. And that was just to say goodbye. I'm leaving. I'm tired. I'm going home. He said, what do I do? What do you tell a guy like that? What do you tell the guy? Five days before, he went to the altar before witnesses and in the sight of God, and he said, I will be with this woman in sickness and in health for rich, for poor, till death do us part. Was she dead? No. Was she unfaithful? No. Where does he belong? He belongs with her. I said, have you tried to work this through with her? Are you trying to, so you can be together? He said, yes, but nothing is working. We're at sword points together. And you know what he wanted me to tell him? He wanted me to tell him, just go right down to the courthouse, right here in, uh, what was that, Seminole or Orange County, and just tell the, the people that this was all a bad dream and we're going to annul the marriage right now. Now what do you think I told him? What do you think I told him? You know what I told him? I said, you do everything you can. You try everything possible to bring your marriage together. I said, you know what, five days ago you made a commitment with that woman for the rest of your life. 
in sickness and in health, in rich or poor. And I said, she hasn't been unfaithful. She hasn't died. Then you do everything you can to make that marriage work. Folk, those were the hardest words I think I have ever said to a person. It was horrible. But folk, what is a commitment? What's a commitment? What is discipline? What is it? It is the willingness to give everything we have and to stand by it even though it hurts. That's discipline. That's commitment. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 9? What did Jesus say? Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. What did Jesus say about the disciplined life? Luke 9, 23 said, He said to them all, If any man will come after me, if any man will come after me, if anybody will become my disciple, what will they do? Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now what do those words deny and cross, what do those words mean? It means the renouncing and surrendering of impulses, appetites, passions, lusts. Whatever it is that seeks to control our mind, that seeks to become an idol, to lead us away from God's law. Jesus says, I need that. You've got to give it to me. There's no excuse. There's no... This is my heredity. This is an illness that's been in my family for years. My wife is this. My husband is that. He doesn't provide this. She's this and that. Big deal. Big deal. Will we or will we not surrender? That's the issue. And Jesus... Never asking somebody to do something that he wasn't willing to do. What did Jesus do? Do you think Jesus wanted to sweat blood? Do you think Jesus wanted to be arrested? Do you think Jesus wanted to live for 33 years amongst demon-possessed people? Do you think he wanted to argue and get into interaction with religious bigotry for 33 years? From the time he was a child of 12 till the time he was 33 when he died on a cross, he was hearing doubt and unbelief and cruelty and nasty names. Why did he go through that? That he might show you and me there's a way out of this world. It's not through excuses. It's not through because of somebody else's problems that I'm the way I am. Uh uh. The issue is will I? Surrender to the one who has surrendered before me.
my Northwest mom sent me this um, little story. It's called The Padded Cross. It says, well, here I am, Lord. You said take up your cross, and I'm here to do it. It's not easy, you know, this self-denial thing. I mean, to go through with it, though, yes, sir. I'll bet you wish more people were willing disciples like me. I've counted the cost and surrendered my life, and it's not an easy road. You mind if I look over these crosses? I'd kind of like a new one. Not that I'm fussy, you understand, but a disciple has to be relevant these days. I was wondering, are there any uh, crosses that are vinyl padded? I, I'm thinking of attracting others, you see, and if I could show them a comfortable cross, I'm sure I could win a lot more. I've got to keep up with the population explosion and all, and, and I need something durable so I can treasure it always. Oh, there's one that's sort of flat, so it would fit under my coat. One that shouldn't be too obvious. Funny, there doesn't seem to be much choice here. Just coarse, rough wood, I mean, that would hurt. Don't you have something more distinctive, Lord? I can tell you right now, none of my friends are going to be impressed by this shoddy workmanship. They'll think I'm a nut or something, and my family will be mortified. What's that? It's either one of these or forget the whole thing? But Lord, I, I want to be your disciple. I mean, just being with you, that's all that counts, but life has to have a balance too. Who's going to be attracted by this self-denial bit? I mean, I want to, but let's not overdo it. Start getting radical like this and they'll have me off to the funny farm. You know what I mean? I mean, being a disciple is challenging and exciting and I want to do it, but I do have some rights, you know. Now, let's see. Uh, no blood? Uh, okay. I, I just can't stand the thought of that, Lord. Uh, Lord? Jesus? Now, where do you suppose he went? In closing this morning, I want to look at one last passage. Philippians chapter 3. We read that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We notice that the foolish virgins the foolish virgins had knowledge but lacked the spirit of God. They knew God but they didn't know God. Jesus knows us but he tells the foolish virgins, I know you not. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul understood that to know Christ, to have a true knowledge of God, involves the total surrender, the total subjection of all passions, all appetites, all lusts to the will of His Maker. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you who reign in the sky and yet 
are intimately knowledgeable of each one of us. You know everything about us, Father. You know everything about us. You love us still. You know our battles. You know our trials. You know our disappointments, our frustrations. Thank you today that we can submit them all to you. And thank you that you'll take them. That you love to take those things away from us. Thank you that in our battles with evil and temptation, thank you, Father, that you will send your angels to give us strength. That you will send your angels to be a shield about us, to give us strength to do what we can't. Thank you that through the cry and the prayer of faith, we can be in subjection to your will and not our own. Please strengthen each one of us. Thank you that the strength is there. Help us not to make any more excuses. But help us to meet our trials head on. And Father, through your strength and help, we can vanquish them. We praise you today for that wonderful truth. In Jesus' name, amen.